So today I want to talk about the aridification of the United States West. I still see a lot of articles and places referring to the U.S. West as being in a drought, or perhaps even describing it as a mega drought. That said, at this point in time, I really think the term drought needs to be recognized as an understatement. Droughts are temporary. They occur over a short period of time with the hope of eventually returning to a normal after they pass. Eventually, things get better from a drought. The U.S. West isn't getting better. It's turning arid. And this process is looking more permanent as time goes on. The combination of climate change and the mismanagement of the Colorado River, as well as many of the other waterways and water resources in the region, has led to a point where things are not likely able to be reversed. Now, I had made a video explaining the condition of the U.S. West last year, and reading reports this year makes it quite evident just how bad things have gotten in the span of a single year. I'll link the video in the description down below, as well as one that talks a little bit about water rights in the region. But if you want to check them out uh, for information or comparison, I highly encourage you to do so. That said, if we look at the situation in Lake Mead, we can actually clearly see just how bad things are getting. So we have here a grouping of images uh, from 2000, 2021, and 2022. And you can clearly see that over the course of 22 years, the water in this particular section of Lake Mead, which is responsible for uh, the power going through the Hoover Dam and the creation of power for many millions of people in this region, this is the levels that it's fallen to in the span of 22 years. And now when I reported on it last uh, year, uh, we saw that it kind of at this 2021 level, and you can see just how much it's dropped in the span of a single year. Um, in case uh, you care, I believe that the camera's blocking this. There's a two uh, kilometer uh, marker uh, and the compass to point that this is in fact pointing up towards north so that you can just get some perspective. But yeah, we see the uh, drop off here from how much water is actually uh, there. In the meanwhile, uh, this is an article that I had looked at uh, last year from Smithsonian Magazine where it said, said, as of last week, the reservoir is just about 200 feet about Deadpool level, totaling about 1,071.56 feet. Now, to remind people, what Deadpool level actually is, is when it reaches that point, which according to uh, more recent estimates, uh, puts it at about uh, 870, uh, 895 feet. When it reaches that level, the water can no longer be pumped through the Hoover Dam to generate electricity, meaning that millions of people are going to lose their power when we reach that level. However, in 2022, we actually see that the value is closer to 150 feet away from Deadpool. Now, uh, the estimate in Smithsonian was a little bit off. Uh, the levels have dropped from uh, we, what we saw as 1,071 feet down to 1,044 feet, which is almost a 30-foot drop in the span of a year. That's ridiculous. That's like so much water that's been lost, considering the fact that we are 150 feet away from Deadpool levels. Now, a lot of places are probably going to take things more seriously now that we're getting closer to those levels. But if things continue as they are, could we see, you know, this region lose power in five years? That's kind of likely. That's what we're seeing as a possibility. And that's really disturbing in a lot of ways. You know, and, and unfortunately, Lake Mead is not the only place in this region that's experiencing this. The uh, Great Salt Lake in Utah is drying up and hitting new record lows in terms of uh, how much water is actually in the Great Lake. I want to remind people that the uh, Great Salt Lake is actually the largest lake in the western United States, west of the Mississippi. And the Great Salt Lake has hit a new historic low for the second time in less than a year. 
a dire milestone as the U.S. West continues to weather its historic mega drought, or as I would prefer to call it, uh, aridification. That, uh, that is lower than the previous historic low set in October, which at the same time matched a 170-year record low. Lake levels are expected to keep dropping until fall or winter, the agency had said, as conditions exacerbated by climate crisis continue to put a strain on water levels. Its dwindling water levels have put millions of migrating birds at risk and threaten a lake-based economy that is worth an estimated $1.3 billion in mineral extraction, brine shrimp, and recreation. The expanding amount of exposed lake bed could also send arsenic lace dust into the air that millions breathe, scientists say. So we need to talk about the ramifications of all of this. When we see drought conditions like this happen, not just in the West Coast of the United States, but globally, we will see circumstances where the migration patterns of animals are deeply affected, where you might see uh, possibly either a drop in populations or even extinction level events from certain species. Further, economies are going to crash. Uh, there's going to be a massive uh, loss of finances as a lot of these regions lose the tools that they were using to make profit off of the land that they were um, making use of and a lot of the waterways they were making use of. And furthermore, you're going to get these weird cases where, like under the lake bed here, you get arsenic lace dust. Um, but, you know, if forests uh, end up, you know, getting destroyed in other parts of the world through forest fires and these droughts end up triggering those, we don't know what kind of strange impacts that each individual case might cause that might have a more profound effect. It might spread diseases, it might spread arsenic, it might, you know, increase lead levels for some reason. The fact remains that all of these climate crises situations that are caused by droughts, forest fires, storms, etc., are going to have impacts that are not fully understood, um, or if they are fully understood, may not be able to be stopped and only may be able to be mitigated and, uh, you know, li the limit the damage that it's going to cause. Now, I do need to point out that we do have the capacity in a lot of this. Um, and even in places like in California, where you're seeing, you know, Lake Oroville and Shasta Lake at critically dry levels, and we're seeing this in a lot of other places in the West, we have the capacity to adapt to all of this and to mitigate a lot of the damage that will be caused by this aridification. See, the problem with all of this, though, is that none of the states in the southwestern United States want to negotiate in a way that causes them to give anything up. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So we have here an article from uh, Politico that's talking about how California and the six other Western states have less than 60 days to pull up a seemingly impossible task. This article was written on July 6th, so just keep that in mind. Cut a multi-way deal to dramatically reduce their consumption of water from the dangerously low Colorado River. If they don't, the federal government will do it for them. And honestly, getting a mediator like the federal government, while I'm not generally in favor of state intervention, like the state coming down on people, these local states have not been able to get their act together at all. And the political arena there is really making a disastrous situation a lot worse. Uh, we have here that despite the oppressive dryness that has plagued the region for more than 20 years, California in large part avoids reductions to its usage of the Colorado River. There's a whole complicated mess of who has rights to what in this region. Now, uh, still negotiations have preceded, uh, been preceded by a century's worth of fighting over access. And so it'll continue to be a very hostile and contested situation. And now we only have a matter of months to settle it. Water authorities also face their own political pressures at home from industries, farmers, uh, indigenous tribes and families who will have to reckon with the outcome of their negotiations. No one wants to raise their hand and volunteer to take big guts because then that makes it easier for everybody else, said John Fleck, a professor of practice in water policy and governance in the University of New Mexico and director of the university's water resource program. Now, I mean, there are certain solutions available. There are 
tough decisions that need to be made. You know, things like, do you continue to uh, alfalfa farm uh, for cattle in this region when it takes so much water? The terms laid out in the weeks uh, that are coming ahead are really going to actually determine not just the West Coast's future, but how a lot of the country responds and how our food supply and how our water supplies end up changing over the course of the next decades. Um, see, the thing is, with when it comes to these states in the West, this battle has been waging for almost 100 years. And honestly, it's not even worth rehashing the specific legal claims that each of these states has worked out or made claim to. What we actually need more than anything else, in my opinion, is that we need an honest assessment of the situation and a reevaluation of priorities. Most of the issues involved, most of the things stopping us from reaching a conclusion that would save lives are economic in nature. Capitalism, the very economic system that has created this climate crisis, isn't going to solve this. We need something a little bit more than, oh, just the free market, you know, running amok, because that hasn't solved it up to this point. None of these states have been able to negotiate things, and they're not going to anytime soon, if, especially if we continue on the route that we're on. And we're going to find that only the wealthiest people, the people who are already in power, the people already at the top of society, will find ways to thrive and survive in the coming reality, and nobody else will. And that's not an optimal solution. That's not a solution that we should be striving towards. What we need instead is a genuine conversation about how to incorporate the needs of people in the entire region and make sure everybody's voice is heard. That means ignoring geopolitical borders and boundaries. It means scrapping the old agreements that have overpromised water sources and given California far more elevated rights than it deserves over the other states. And it means bringing the seven states together with Baja California and Sonora, Mexico, as well as most importantly, bringing in indigenous peoples into the conversation that they've historically been left out of. And it's going to mean that tough decisions need to be made in order to resolve this that will have to result in people changing their social behavior. You know, uh, California, for example, grows four different water intense crops in mass in the middle of a desert. The crops are rice, cotton, alfalfa, and almonds. These could easily be substituted for more drought hardy crops. Arizona is also producing a lot of cotton, uh, if we're being real about it all, and if they were to cut down uh, their cotton production in favor of a different crop, they could save literally, you know, millions of gallons of water. Th this is what we're trying to do in a desert, and it's just not working. It's not sustainable. You know, we also don't need grassy lawns or golf courses in the middle of deserts. We could also see a meat reduction. Uh, you know, we don't have to have livestock being grow, uh, raised in a lot of these regions because it increases the water consumption in these particular regions. Um, you know, meat consumption being lowered would actively uh, benefit a lot of the uh, water systems in the area. Um, we could see water allocated based on need because as water is currently allocated, it is handled in a way where if you have water and you don't use it, you don't get it next time. So we need to stop these quota type systems and put it in favor of if you have extra water and you don't need to use it, especially on alfalfa, which can survive with a lot less water than what's being used right now, make that water available for anybody who needs it at no cost instead of bringing in these nonsense market solutions that they're trying to right now, like trying to create futures exchanges on water markets. This isn't the solution that they think it is, and it's just going to make it that much more inaccessible for people to get access to drinking water when they need it. Now, to be honest, this right here, what I mentioned, would just be a great start to the process, to beginning to negotiate on those terms about what we actually need and what we're willing to get rid of. These would reduce the amount of water significantly. And that's just the start of the conversation. There are other options available. However, all of these decisions come with obvious pros and cons attached to them. And it's going to 
maybe take some time to work out which ones are going to work best for people and we're going to have to have that conversation real quick. For example, water desalination plants are an option. They, you know, they will in fact create more water and be able to pump it into these areas and it might actually create a net surplus of water that maybe can help reverse the aridification. The downsize is it requires an extreme amount of energy. It has a major waste product in the brine that it produces. And if we're talking about the level of energies that we're dealing with, that's probably gonna involve nuclear energy. And uh, that means you have to store nuclear waste. That means you have to handle brine production. And where is all that gonna go? Where do you put the brine in the aftermath? And, you know, I, you know, it's always, almost always the most impoverished communities that end up having to take on a lot of these waste products into their communities and into their neighborhoods. So that may not be an optimal solution for everybody. So there has also been an alternative option that talks about rerouting parts of the Mississippi River just below the point where it usually freezes and have it diverted into the region and essentially create a river, uh, some have called it Mississippi West, where it will trail from the Mississippi River all the way into the west coast of the United States. However, this brings up a lot of questions about potential side effects, especially as we've failed to engineer nature properly throughout all of this. Uh, lake Mead is in fact a uh, artificial lake and we see what's going on there. Um, I don't know what sort of side effects this would have for the Mississippi or even for the regions that it would have to travel through. Um, another option is to increase the use of gray water. So if you're not familiar with what gray water is, it's water that's been uh, run through sinks but has not come into contact with anything that would be attached to like a toilet or sewer system specifically. So shower water, uh, water that you'd use to wash your hands, uh, things that you'd pour down the sink. Um, you know, if you have like a, a pot of water or whatever when you're washing dishes, you know, that kind of thing would end up as gray water. And some of that can be used to water crops. And while a lot of people talk about how safe it is, there is a potential risk because it increases the amount of pathogens that are going into the soil that we're growing our crops in. And while it may be a necessity in certain circumstances to do this, it could also leave some people who are immunocompromised as well as many other populations a little bit less safe. The truth is that we don't have any foolproof solution to any of this, and there's going to be a lot of pros and cons that need to be addressed. That said, more than anything, I really believe that this requires a social shift in weighing the pros and cons of all of these options, not in terms of economics like it's currently being done, but in the survivability and needs of people. These types of hard decisions are going to be uh, the ones that need to be made in pretty much every region experiencing climate change and the crises of similar proportions that are occurring across the globe. People will have to sit at the table and make decisions that mutually benefit us all. And it's worth pointing out that just like in this case, our leaders have failed us for the past 100 years where they've allowed the climate to get to this point. Both the state and capitalism have failed us entirely. What we need instead is a form of democratic or consensus-based model where we allocate resources based on need. We need to rid ourselves of these authoritarians who keep thinking they know best and keep making self-interested decisions that end up harming us all in the long run. So with that said, if you've watched uh, this video through to the end and you enjoyed the content, please do consider liking the video, subscribing, and leaving a comment, as well as consider joining my Discord where we have conversations on topics like these. If you're in a financial place to do so, and only if you're in a financial place to do so, do consider supporting me on Patreon, especially as political content like this can often be demonetized on YouTube. The links for everything that I've mentioned in the video are in the description down below. And with that said, my name is Anarchist Terra. Thank you so much for watching.